as I said, good afternoon in, in Asia, good, good afternoon in, uh, in Europe. Uh, welcome to uh, your Enterprise Europe Networks uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, today we'll be talking about doing business in Vietnam, exploring opportunities in the local agri-food sector. So it's a hot topic, Vietnam and agri-food sector. And a lot of experts. But without any further ado, I would like uh, to invite, and it's a great uh, honor and privilege to invite the EU ambassador to Vietnam, Mr. Julien Gaillet, to share a word as an opening note with us today. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Yes, good morning or good afternoon to all of you. Uh, good afternoon, Adam. It's, uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to be here, I must say, with you today. Uh, because I invested a lot of my professional life in uh, supporting the internationalization of SMEs. I actually, a long time ago, uh, was uh, in charge of running the Enterprise Europe Network in Japan, and I was later in charge of the EEN itself uh, as um, director of the uh, European SME Agency. So uh, I don't need con to convince you, and you don't need to convince myself, on the importance of SMEs, not just for our economic um, structure in the European Union, uh, but also uh, for the more than 99% of all companies in uh, Europe. They provide two thirds of our jobs and they contribute to half of Europe's GDP. Uh, so it's really pivotal, and I see it today in Vietnam. Most enterprises that are coming here and are interested to invest in the market are SMEs. Uh, it is estimated uh, that 90% of the growth uh, globally will originate uh, from outside the EU, and we are here in the ASEAN, and particularly in Vietnam, in the highest growth uh, center of the world, Vietnam has been growing at a rate of 7% for the past 15 or, or 20 years, and we estimate that it will have a growth of 125% in the next 10 years, making it the fastest growing country on earth. Uh, so uh, uh, needless to say that uh, opportunities abound here in a stable uh, country uh, with uh, increasingly good infrastructure, a young and motivated and well-educated uh, workforce. The program uh, to support um, SMEs in Europe, uh, COSME, or now part of the, the internal market uh, program, has been a key instrument to support SMEs accessing finance, but also accessing markets, including uh, third country uh, markets. It's not always easy for SMEs to find their way abroad, especially as far away as, um, as in Vietnam. Uh, but uh, the program, the European Union, and our support instruments are here uh, to, to support them. In Vietnam in particular, we are fortunate to have an FTA between the European Union and Vietnam uh, that is designed not just for large companies, but also for, for SMEs, and that has been the engine of our growing trade and investment between the EU and Vietnam. Vietnam has become now our first export market and our first trading partner in the, in the ASEAN, uh, in spite of the fact that it's not and by far the largest market. The FTA uh, is uh, continuing... Uh, duties are being progressively reduced. Uh, under the FTA, uh, the Vietnamese have also committed, for instance, to develop a central web portal for adv advertising procurement contracts. They publish summaries of these notices in English. Uh, and I can tell you, because I'm speaking here to, to European companies established here, SMEs, uh, in services such as engineering, architectural services, they are competing on an equal basis. They consider that the market is open and they are getting uh, contracts. Uh, the FTA is sometimes uh, complex to navigate for SMEs, and that's why the EU has prepared a practical guide of the FTA that is available. Uh, we also have established an IPR help desk for Southeast Asia, uh, which supports uh, SMEs understand how to protect 
their intellectual property rights here in Vietnam. And we have a market access database that gives you also uh, a lot of information about uh, the Vietnamese market conditions. We have been also supporting the initial phase of the implementation of the FTA in the past three, four years uh, by offering practical information on how best to use that FTA. Uh, and we have, uh, as a result of uh, those sessions, produced a guide for SMEs on Vietnamese trade and investment conditions, uh, which, uh, which are still available for consultation. Uh, so again, I would really encourage SMEs from Europe uh, to come here. They stand to gain from the removal of custom duties, simplified custom procedures, enhanced transparency, easier access to contract bidding, the elimination of technical barriers to trade, strengthened intellectual property rights uh, protection. Um, they can rely, uh, our companies also on uh, a number of government to govern committees where we are raising on a regular basis the issue. Uh, the EU uh, is really committed to support the internationalization of European SMEs, as you've underst uh, understood. Uh, and I, I would conclude by inviting all SMEs to make the best use of uh, the EU services, the EEN uh, resources, uh, to uh, invest and export uh, to um, uh, Vietnam. Uh, I am convinced uh, really that um, we can pave the way here uh, for future shared growth and prosperity that will benefit individual companies and our bilateral trade as a whole. So I, I wish you a very good seminar this afternoon. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm uh, looking forward to seeing many more SMEs from Europe uh, acceding, uh, accessing Vietnam in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for, for this opening note. And indeed, uh, we can say on the Vietnamese side, if I may say, we are very lucky to have uh, our colleagues in Europe uh, trying and helping in every country in Brussels, of course, uh, with a lot of leadership. So we are very lucky to have these partners and this strong network in, in every country. So let's go to the agenda. We have discussed and we'll, we will do two parts. Basically, the part one, we want to bring it together as a uh, the ambassador mentioned uh, we need to understand the business opportunities. We need to understand the way to uh, grasp, grasp the opportunities, especially within the EVFTA frame. And of course, I think in Vietnam, it's important to understand the business uh, practices, what's happening in the business culture. And this is why we have these three experts that, that have actually a tough task today with uh, uh, 40 minutes of time to discuss about this. Uh, please go in the, in, the, in the slide just before so I can uh, give a bit more presentation of the, the panelists. Yes, thank you. So we have Mr. Laurent Nguyen with Mazar Vietnam. He will be talking about the market and sector overview. Mr. Julien Tran, Rosemont Business Asia, doing business in practice EVFTA framework, just as, just as we have mentioned. And then Dr. Rémi Nguyen, MLR Constantin, doing business in practice, but more about the business culture. And in part two, we'll be going through an experience, and we have the pleasure to discuss today with Mr. Philippe Perruchot, with the company Saint-Honoré, Knight of the Order of Agricultural Merit since 2023. And we'll, uh, uh, Philippe will share uh, experience in F&B, in production, in distribution, here as a company in, uh, in, in Vietnam, and then we'll have a Q&A to make it interactive, we hope. So please do not hesitate to use also the, the tool to share your questions so our, uh, our panelists today can answer them. And without any, way, any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Laurent Nguyen with Maza. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can see you. Yes, we can hear you and we can see uh, your presentation yes. share. Yeah, okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's start, let's start diving um, in the market overview. Uh, maybe first, uh, a few words. Uh, I've been in Vietnam uh, for over 10 years. Uh, and sorry, sorry, Laurent. 
Sorry, yes. Laurent. If the, the, the audio is okay, but not perfect. Maybe you can adjust so we can hear you just a bit better. Okay. Sorry, thank you. Stay or better? Uh, or... Is okay, it better? So it's a bit better. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit better. Let me know if it's not. I have a screen. Okay. So, um, as a partner at Mazar Vietnam, I've had the opportunity to support businesses uh, from in the, in the whole life cycle, from the establishment in Vietnam to building factories, operations, and so on. And uh, it's, a, it's my pleasure today to try to share in 15 minutes uh, as much as I can on the market here. So we'll be covering two aspects uh, here. On the first, starting with macroeconomics and demographics. And then second, jumping and diving into the agri-food sector in Vietnam. Um, I think the slides will be shared. You'll have a bit more information on publications that you have on Mazar uh, at the end of this, uh, at this slide. So first, on the macroeconomics. So as shared by Xinyang uh, a bit before, Vietnam, as compared to its neighbors in Asia, is one of the fastest growing economies. Despite growing inflation, it does uh, rank number two right behind the Philippines in the forecast for 2024 in terms of GDP growth rate, real GDP growth rate, to about 6%. If we look at the evolution, uh, pre-COVID evolution was uh, on the average trend of nearly 7% growth per year. COVID disrupted uh, the GDP growth going down to below 3%, and then with a follow-up catch-up effect of 8% in the 2022. And for 2024, the latest uh, forecast I was looking at by the international banks and, and the state are giving a 6 to 6.5 GDP growth for this year. That growth uh, for 2024 is expected to be mostly driven uh, from industrial sector and service, for the supply, uh, for the supply side, and on the demand side, it is meant to be driven mostly by consumption and investment. On demographics, Vietnam counts a population of 100 million inhabitants. Uh, the median age is a bit below 33 years old, which makes it a quite young population. Half, over half of the population is in the labor force. We have a fertility rate in Vietnam of two children per woman, uh, above the 1.6 average that we have in Europe. And that results in a uh, golden age, a golden population ratio, which means that Vietnam counts two persons in working age for one dependent, dependent uh, being people below 15 years old and above 65 years old. So that gives a lot of uh, traction and, and force and dynamism in the country. When we look at the distribution of the population <coughs> across the country, the four main regions account for two thirds of the population. And this is mostly driven by two regions, which are the Red River Delta region with Hanoi and Haiphong in the north, and the Southeast region, with Ho Chi Minh City, Mung Tao, uh, Beiyun in, in the south. The top 10 cities account basically for nearly 40% of the total population. And the main, the highest, uh, the cities, the cities with the highest GRDP are in those top three regions. And those are mostly driven by the logistic hubs with Mung Tao and Haiphong respectively in the south and in the north, with the uh, industrial zones and manufacturing zones, uh, both in the south and in the north. And finally, with the financial services uh, in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City. So now let's jump into the agri-food sector. The GDP generated by agri-food sector itself was uh, up to 86 billion US dollars, which is over 20% of the total country GDP. And in the agri-food sector, within the three segments being agricultural production, FNB manufacturing, and FNB distribution, the agricultural production itself 
account for two thirds of the agri food GDP and three quarter of the workforce population in the agri food sector. So that is to say, the agri food sector is has a very strong footprint in Vietnam. Now, looking at some Oxford economics study uh, that was done just after COVID and comparing benchmarking in ASEAN countries across two factors, uh, one factor being the overall recovery expected capacity, and second, the food industry fiscal risk. We can see that Vietnam did rank number two on the first, meaning Vietnam is, was expected and is, is actually a very resilient country with mostly uh, three drivers, the household food spending, which keep growing, the uh, favorable food trade policies, and finally, the stable uh, foreign exchange rates evolution over the years. The, on the second criteria, which was the food industry fiscal risk, Vietnam ranked number four behind Singapore, Japan, and Korea. And that was quite a good performance and, and showing uh, a lot of trust. And now we are in 2024, and we can see the fiscal policies have actually been supportive with lower uh, VAT rates and so on. Now, if we zoom on the FNB itself, that is very important to understand that in Vietnam, over 35% of the monthly spending are on FNB, and that accounts for 15% of the country GDP. There are a few prominent criteria and characteristics. Vietnam has this very young and affluent population. There's a very strong culture of healthy food and uh, there has been an increasing demand for organic food and local production for this. There is also a transformation of the whole FNB retail uh, landscape with the expansion of, a, of a convenience stores, building chains with quality and high standard of hygiene, and also a digitalization of the retail uh, models with uh, the use of platforms. Um, and that has been enhanced and accelerated with COVID. And we've seen major e commerce players engaging into the FNB during COVID. And also a lot of uh, uh, players in the FNB space moving towards online retail as well. And that is heavily supported by this young population that we mentioned and a very high penetration rate uh, of smartphone and internet across the country and across all the locations, not only the, the cities, but also in rural areas. Now, as, as, uh, as it has been shared slightly a bit before, uh, there's important trends uh, between uh, EU and Vietnam, with 10% of the trades uh, from EU to Vietnam. So Vietnam is a, is a key trade partner, uh, and vice versa, around 7% of imports uh, in Vietnam coming from the EU. Looking at the evolution over the past five years, we can see there's actually an increasing and growing trend of, of this trade and across all product categories. And this has certainly been enabled and uh, supported by the implementation and the effectiveness of the EFTA since 2020. Now, what about the brands? foreign brands, domestic brands. So if we split this segment of agri the agri-food into these three segments of agricultural production, F&B manufacturing and F&B distribution, what we can see within the top 10 brands, we can see that, that the foreign players are mostly present into F&B distribution and F&B manufacturing. The foreign, the foreign players are mostly coming from three regions, Asia, US and Europe. So let's dive now a bit into agricultural production. Most of foreign players present in the market are into the feed segment only, not into fertilizers, agrochemicals, not, not either into production. 
So those players are mostly Asians and and from Europe. Now into FMB manufacturing. In dairy products, foreign main players are mostly from the US and Europe. We can see strong, very strong brands, European brands, mostly in both fictionary and nutrition. As for sauces, spices, dried food, and even fresh food, we can see that most of the foreign players are, are Asian, and that can certainly be explained by cultural and food taste similarities. As for the alcoholic drinks and non-alcoholic drinks, we have a, quite a mix of, Euro, of European strong worldwide brands, but also Asian brands with Japanese brands. Finally, on the food uh, and beverage distribution segment, for FMB services, most of the, the big foreign players are mostly from the US and from Asia. Asia have been Japanese, Korean, and Philippines, the type. And on the retail, most players, most foreign players are now from Thailand and from Japan. Thank you. If we look at the past 10 years on top m and deals and private placements, what is noticeable is that seven out of 10 deals were made by foreign buyers and eight out of those 10 deals were into the f and segment. So in a nutshell, Vietnam has a very strong potential with a dynamic population growing population and growing economy and a very resilient mindset. As for the agri-food sector itself, we can see it is a sizable market and it is foreign uh, investors friendly. With two key points I'd like to highlight. One is the, the high number of free trade agreements, not only with Europe, but one of the, with across all different regions one of the highest countries, Vietnam is one of the highest countries in terms of number of free trade agreements that brings a lot of opportunities and that will be developed later. But to enter Vietnam market and do business here, it is important to factor cultural aspects and have a good cultural adaptation uh, into your strategy. So those two aspects, the VFTA and the cultural aspect will be covered uh, in the two next sessions. Uh, by my fellow speakers. Thank you for listening and happy to take any questions in the Q&A session or separately uh, on your respective case uh, after this webinar. Back to you. Thank you. you. Thank you, Laurent Nguyen with Mazar for this actually very precise with a lot of details presentation. Thank you for, for presenting and explaining the, 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 the sector, the agri-food sector in Vietnam. And uh, as you just mentioned, actually now uh, it's time for us to deep uh, and understand better about the EVFTA, the uh, regulatory framework, and how to grasp the opportunities Laurent mentioned with uh, a perfect mastering of the EVFTA. Julien, Julien Tran, RBA, the floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me uh, properly? It's fine? Perfectly. All right, so let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me for, for, for this webinar. So indeed, I will uh, try to explain uh, with simple words and, uh, and, and without being too, too, uh, too uh, boring the EVFTA and how to apply it. Um, what are the benefits of the EVFTA and how to apply it? So firstly, just a very quick presentation. We are RBA, which we are an accounting tax law firm based in Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, we have offices in Singapore, Vietnam, uh, uh, Thailand, and uh, and, um, and that's it. So I'm not going to take too much time on this. So uh, what is the EVFTA? So uh, this is, uh, as you know, uh, the, the EU-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement signed on June 2019 and approved by the European Parliament uh, on uh, February 2020, 
ratified by the National Assembly of Vietnam in 2020, in June 2020. So uh, the purpose, the, 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 the whole purpose of this, uh, of this uh, agreement is to ease uh, the custom duties and to try to eliminate uh, the, the custom duties. Uh, but it, as, I, as I will explain, it will be done like progressively. So um, before before uh, before the ratification of uh, the EVFTA, uh, import duties uh, of up to fifty percent of the, the the European export of agri food products and up to seventy eight percent on industrial goods uh, are. are, are, are um, so, the, so, so, so there were the tax on, on those on those uh, on, on those products, and now with the EVFTA, we are trying to reduce those uh, those, uh, those 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 rates uh, to and try, as I say, to uh, to eliminate uh, those uh, those tax uh, in uh, after like uh, progressively and achieve that after ten years. Uh, so the. The, the the conditions for uh, for the application of the EVFTA is that, of course, as you can guess, uh, the product must be originated in a Europe uh, Union, European Union, or in Vietnam. Origin. What does that mean? It means that the product is wholly obtained in the EU or Vietnam, or it's produced exclusively from materials originating in the EU or Vietnam or is produced in the EU or Vietnam using non-originating materials, provided that such materials have undergone sufficient working or processing by fulfilling the product-specific rules set out in the, in, in the EVFTA. So, uh, so that will be, I, I think, the, 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 the most challenging point for, in practice for the for, 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 for the importer and exporter is to prove that the products are originating from uh, the, uh, uh, the EU or, or, or from Vietnam. To prove that, that origin, there's two ways. First one is the certificate of origin. So the, the exporter must complete a certificate of origin and wait for the certificate to be issued by the authorized agency. There's a second way, what we call the declaration of origin, and it allows exporters to certify by themselves the, the origin of their products uh, or uh, on any commercial documents. Only the declaration of origin will be used for European exporters, independent of the value of the shipment, if they are registered in the register exporter system, the REX. The Vietnamese exporters can self-declare uh, so use, you, they, they can use the declaration of origin if the value of the shipment does not exceed 6,000 euros. So what are the benefits uh, of the AVFTA for the European exporters? So, um, of course, as I, as I explained, there will be a progressive elimination of custom duties for a range of products. There will also be streamlined custom procedures and better market access, faster clearance at Vietnamese ports. Uh, so faster clearance at Vietnamese ports and uh, more effic efficient as well. Uh, for approved categories of products, import will be automatically allowed without your individual inspections. Uh, there will also be reduced bureaucracy and administrative hurdles. Enforceability of the regulation, formal state to state dispute resolution mechanism, quality standard alignments and protection of geographical indication, and promotion of foreign direct investment in Vietnam. European companies can explore joint venture or establish production facilities in Vietnam. So we can see that with this, uh, with, uh, with the ratification of the EVFTA, it will be much easier for European exporters to. Uh, to uh, to uh, to develop their business in Vietnam. Uh, specifically for the agri-food sector, we identify some benefits as well. Uh, in particular, there will be a preferential tax rate for certain products. 
right after the agreement came into effect, such as seafood, rice, vegetables, key Vietnamese products as well, uh, like rice, mushroom, sugar products, shall benefit from significant access to the EU market via tariff rate quotas, allowing them to be imported into the, U the, the European uh, Union with zero duties. Rules of origin and protection of geographical indication provides uh, Vietnamese agriculture and aquatic products opportunities to increase their product value on the EU markets. And legal protection against counterfeiting of certain products. 169 geographical indications so far are recognized as protected European products by the Vietnamese market. Uh, I wanted also to show you some uh, some example of products, uh, some uh, some example of progressive reduction of uh, of um, of uh, tax uh, uh, duties. So let's take for example we have artichokes uh, with a reduction uh, to zero percent of uh, of uh, tax by six year. So ten percent. Uh, in the first year, 6% in the third year, and 0% on the sixth year. Similarly, for example, scallops, we also have the, uh, the reduction, uh, but this time on eight years, so 22% for the first year, 12.5% uh, uh, on the fourth year, and 0% uh, and on the eighth year, and so on. So you, you have this list of, uh, of, um, this list of uh, products. Uh, you, you can check uh, on, the, on the EVFTA. And you will see that uh, that depending on the product, you will have some reduction, different different uh, timeline. But uh, the objective is the same: to try uh, to reduce to zero percent after some 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 uh, some amount of years. Then let's take an example for for for, for you to understand. Uh, so we took. Uh, uh, the example of uh, wine exporters, uh, a dairy farmer and wine exporters. So, for you to to know that uh, in uh, in 2021, so after the, the after the the, the the ratification of the uh, the EVFTA, the the there was an increase of the dairy consumption in Vietnam. Uh, the revenue doubled uh, in 2021. Um, since all tariffs will be abolished in a maximum of five years after the, int uh, the entry into force of the EVFTA, so August 2025, with some quicker reduction after three years for most cheese, uh, milk powder, and liquid milk, uh, we believe that European farmers have the opportunity to increase exportation to Vietnam uh, and to expand their uh, customer base and increase their revenue. Uh, regarding the wine, we have, uh, uh, as you know, a growing demand for high quality of European wine. And let's say that uh, if a European wine producer wants to expand its market in Vietnam, as, a, as, as, a, as you can guess, uh, with the EVFTA, the, the tax will reduce and the wine can now enter the country with reduced import duties and after August 2027, with zero import duties, so that's a that's a very big difference from from before EVFTA to 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 uh, to uh, the situation that will be in 2027. Uh, so we believe that with this uh, reduced import duties, uh, the European wine uh, will become more competitive uh, in Vietnam compared to the wine from non-European uh, countries. So in conclusion, uh, the EVFTA opened doors uh, for enhanced trade relations. Vietnam's agricultural sector is one of the biggest beneficiaries of the EVFTA so far. Vietnam's revenue from export to the EU has increased significantly. Uh, continued collaboration and compliance are crucial. Vietnam's agricultural sector is considered one of the biggest beneficiaries of the EVFTA. So, um, uh, finally, I would like also to share a case that we had uh, in, in, in our firm. So the, the, the situation was that we had a, a European SME uh, specializing in agri-food products, uh, importing their products to Vietnam. So uh, the fact is, 
all their products, as I said, the, the challenge is to prove that the product is originated from 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 a country uh, from the country of the EU. The thing is, uh, the thing is, all the product had a valid certificate of origin. However, before uh, sending the, those products to Vietnam, uh, that company was uh, beforehand importing those products to a look to a subsidiary located in Switzerland. As you know, the Switzerland is not a party of the EVFTA. So the question was. Since the, uh, there was a, a step between the importation from uh, the exportation, sorry, from uh, Europe to Vietnam, and the step in between was Switzerland, can we apply uh, the benefit of the EFTA? So that was the, the, the question from, from, from the client here. Um, so the framework in this case is that, uh, is that. Uh, um, uh, the, the product is considered originating in a, in a party of the EFTA when it is wholly obtained in a party, or if it is not wholly obtained, non originating uh, materials, uh, but they have undergone sufficient working or processing in such party. So if it's not originating, uh, if it's not wholly sorry, obtained in a party, it must at least uh, undergone sufficient working processing in such in such party. Furthermore, the goods should remain in the original country of origin during the transit, storage, and splitting in non party if they have not been altered and if the transit has always been under the supervision of custom authorities. So that is the legal framework. Uh, so in case in case uh, the, the, the transit in a non-party uh, of the EFTA in, in this, in our case in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, the good must must satisfy the non-alteration requirement and must be accompanied accompanied with a documentary proof of compliance issued by the country of transit. Uh, so it's possible. Uh, to apply the EVFTA even if the products have transited into a non-party of the EVFTA, but you have to produce some uh, documents, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in particular, you have to uh, satisfy to the non-alteration requirements. And that can be a challenge, actually. That can be a challenge uh, to obtain such a document. And furthermore, it's also possible that uh, the custom authorities in Vietnam might request some other uh, further evidence to prove that the goods have not undergone uh, to uh, any operation beyond what is necessary to preserve them in good condition during the transit. So it's possible by principle to still benefit from the EFTA, but it's still a challenge. Uh, that's why that's why we uh, that's why we, we we have recommended in this case, uh, if it's possible for the client to not transit uh, the product from a non-party of the EFTA, but to uh, to use maybe another uh, another subsidiary uh, from a country part of the EFTA, and at, uh, in this case, the client had another subsidiary uh, located in France. Uh, in this case, there's no issue. If the subsidiary is part of the uh, is part of the EVFTA uh, uh, of, of a country part of the EVFTA, it, there, there's no issue. There's no need to to uh, to to uh, uh, to uh, bring to the to the uh, Vietnamese authority any any further uh, further proof. So, if it's possible, we we, we have advised the the, the um, uh, that client to use another subsidiary from Switzerland. From Switzerland. If it's not possible, if the clients still want to use Switzerland, then it's still possible, but uh, but uh, it can be more challenging, and uh, and uh, and and the client has to provide more proof. Um, so I will not enter in uh, in further details. Uh, I think it was already uh, there, there was a really lot of information. Uh, so in case you have more questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, and we can discuss further uh, at that moment. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me well, Julien? Because I have to change my uh, my device. Yes, I can hear you well. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julien. But I could follow your speech on YouTube, actually, because we are all live also on uh, YouTube. Thank you very much for sh sharing these insights on the, the EVFTA. And I would like to talk about the business culture, because uh, here at EEN Vietnam, actually, we, we do have uh, an office in uh, Hanoi. We do have an office in Ho Chi Minh City, where am I uh, seated today? And um, we do see some cultural differences in business, uh, not only in business, actually, but in business. And today, we are very happy to have Dr. Rémi Nguyen with MLR Constantin to share a bit more about these cultural differences to better understand and do business in Vietnam. Yes, thank you very much, um, uh, Adam. Uh, let me uh, show you your, your, my presentation. Okay, can okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm uh, Dr. Remy Nguyen. I am um, one of the partner of MLR Constantin and also one of the vice president of the French uh, Chamber of Commerce. And today I'm going to talk about the cultural codes uh, in business conduct in uh, Vietnam. So. Vietnam economic landscape is um, characterized by two key regions, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, Hanoi, the political capital, lies in the northern part of the country and serves as the focal point for economic development in this region. With its strategic location and the development uh, triangle of Hanoi, high form Quang Ninh, it offers significant advantages for attracting high-tech investments and fostering growth across various industries. Hanoi is home to a diverse range of sectors, including manufacturing, electronics, services, finance, banking, logistics, and agriculture. As a headquarter of many state-owned and private enterprises, Hanoi plays a crucial role in driving economic progress in northern Vietnam. On the other hand, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, now that the economic capital, is uh, situated in the southern part of Vietnam. This uh, dynamic city leads the way uh, in uh, industrialization and modernization efforts, contributing a substantial portion, 45% of the country's GDP. Alongside Ho Chi Minh City, um, several provinces uh, in the southern region, such as uh, Dong Nai, Binh Dương, and uh, Vung Tao, have emerged as key centers for foreign direct investment. Uh, together, they form a, vi a vital economic hub, serving as a primary gateway for Vietnam's commerce and trade connections with the rest of the world. Overall, the economic landscape of Vietnam is characterized by the complementary roles placed by Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, each contributing to the country's growth and development in their unique way. For climate to, cu to cuisine, wine preferences to cultural traits, uh, these two regions offer unique experiences that reflect their distinct identities. Let's start with the north. The northern region of Vietnam experiences four distinct seasons, each with its own specialties, fruits and flowers. Summers are warm, while winters can be significantly cooler, offering a delightful contrast throughout the year. Northern Vietnamese cuisine is renowned for its balance and mild taste, featuring sophisticated flavor combinations. The fertile lands of the Red River Delta contribute to the production of rice, herbs, and vegetables, enriching the culinary scene with fresh and aromatic ingredients. When it comes to uh, wine, the North has a preference for the red wine, often seen as a fourfold gift. Classic wines and part are particularly esteemed for their sophistication and depth of flavor. In terms of cultural traits, Northerners are often described as traditional, elegant, and somewhat reserved. They can they take pride in their rich cultural heritage and deep-rooted customs, reflecting a sense of time and grace and dignity. Moving on the south, we uh, encounter a different climate and culinary landscape. The southern region of Vietnam uh, has only two distinct seasons, dry and rainy. It tends to be uh, not throughout the year, creating a tropical paradise for sun seekers. Uh, Northern Vietnamese cuisine is characterized by a bold uh, and a vibrant flavor, influenced by neighboring countries like uh, Cambodia and Thailand. Uh, dishes often feature uh, harmonious blend, a sweet, sour, and spicy elements, reflecting the region's cultural diversity. Unlike the North, wine in uh, the South is uh, enjoyed more casually, uh, often as part of uh, festive celebrations or social gatherings. While champagne is popular for special occasions, locals uh, also have a penchant for mid-range wines with larger volumes, adding a touch of festivity to the gatherings. 
In terms of cultural trades, Southerners are known for their warm hospitality, energy, and openness. They embrace diversity and innovation, reflecting the dynamic spirit for the region and creating a vibrant tapestry of tradition and traditions and customs. In the North, communication takes a poetic veil, reflecting uh, the nuanced expression found within the Vietnamese uh, language. Uh, even in business uh, settings, speech uh, often carries political undertones. Uh, whether on stress is established, it runs deep, uh, forming the foundation for successful partnerships. Uh, building strong human relationships is uh, paramount as business transactions rely heavily on trust and mutual understanding. Marketing strategy hinge on a word of mouth and prioritize security, considering the complex political and legal landscape. Conversely, the South embraces a more direct approach to communication, fostering a common understanding between parties. With a greater openness to international customs, people in, the, uh, in Southern Vietnam readily adapt to diverse perspectives. Trust is cultivated by recognizing shared interests and objectives. In terms of marketing, allocating budget resources for comprehensive strategies is feasible, leveraging the region's simpler understanding of the business environment and economic framework. Um, in the northern region of Vietnam, uh, traditional distribution channels uh, form the backbone of commerce. Uh, these channels are built on a long-standing relationship and trust, emphasizing personal connections uh, in business transactions. Uh, major cities like Hanoi and Haiphong uh, serve as hubs for distribution centers, facilitating the movement of goods throughout the region. Uh, local wholesalers and distributors play uh, pivotal roles in this uh, distribution network, serving as intermediaries between producers and retailers. Uh, traditional markets and small retail shops uh, um, dot the landscape, serving as a vital touch points for consumers to access goods. However, navigating the southern di uh, northern distribution channel comes with, with its uh, challenges. Limited infrastructure and logistic capabilities pose obstacles to efficient distribution, while cultural nuances and preferences shape consumer behavior. Additionally, the entrenched nature of traditional practices may lead to a slower uptake to, uh, of a new distribution channels. Uh, understanding uh, and respecting uh, Vietnamese cultural nuances is a paramount of a successful products development and marketing strategies in Vietnam. Uh, cultural awareness uh, not only fosters deeper connections with consumers, but also enhances brand acceptance and loyalty. So tailoring products, features and uh, packaging um, to effectively, uh, effectively uh, resonate with Vietnamese consumers, it's essential to, customers, to customize the products attributes such as flavors, colors, and uh, design to align with uh, local tested and uh, preferences. Uh, for the strategic marketing approaches, uh, crafting marketing strategies that resonate with um, Vietnamese cultural values, traditions, uh, and uh, uh, social uh, norms uh, is crucial for success uh, in the market. Um, it's um, uh, quite uh, Im uh, important um, to um, uh, to find the right representative, uh, which serve as a face of the company in the country, advocating for the interest and uh, protecting the um, the reputation uh, of uh, the um, the company. So, when choosing a partner, uh, it's uh, it could be relevant to consider several key criteria. Uh, ideally, the representative should possess dual nationality, uh, including Vietnamese uh, citizenship, or have a dual cultural background with a proficiency in both uh, English and uh, Vietnamese. This ensures effective communication and understanding in diverse business uh, environments. Additionally, uh, adaptability and flexibility are crucial qualities. Uh, the representative should be uh, well versed uh, in the uh, local business landscapes, capable of navigating uh, cultural nuances and adopt uh, building uh, relationships. Uh, finding the white um, uh, uh, distributors uh, for uh, understanding market dynamics uh, to effectively penetrate the Vietnamese markets, uh, it's essential to comprehend the intricacies of uh, market dynamics. This involves a comprehensive analysis of market trends, consumer preferences, and uh, the competitive landscape. By um, identifying emerging trends and understanding consumer behavior, it will be better to tailor the strategies to meet market demands effectively. Uh, 
uh, for the selection of a criteria. Um, selecting the right distribution partner requires a well-defined set of criteria. This includes assessing their experience, reputation, network, and uh, financial uh, stability. Conducting due diligence uh, prior to uh, engaging with potential distributors, due diligence is imperative. This involves researching their track record, customer's feedback, and market reputation. Additionally, re-referring their legal compliance, licenses, and certifications answer regulatory adherence and mitigates legal risk associated with distribution activities. Initiating a, a, um, a nurturing relationship uh, with potential distributors is key to fostering successful, successful partnerships. For the learning uh, expedition, uh, embarking on a learning expedition in Vietnam offers participants uh, a multifaceted experience encompassing cultural immersion, uh, business exploration, environmental awareness, and uh, community engagements. Uh, through a diverse range of activities such, a, uh, such as a company visits, uh, interaction with uh, startups, and uh, engagement with local communities, participants gain invaluable insights into Vietnamese customs, uh, business environment, uh, environmental challenges, and uh, social uh, issues. So, for example, the um, CCI uh, France Vietnam offers a tailored program aimed uh, at uh, providing participants with a comprehensive understanding of Vietnam's thrilling business and economic ecosystem. Through creative activities and expert lay sessions, participants gain unique insights into the opportunities and challenges shaping Vietnam's future. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I am at your disposal for any further information. Thank you very much, Remy. Uh, very, uh, very interesting uh, insights on the difference between the South and, and, and the North. Uh, actually, Remy now is in the North and I'm in the South, so very, very interesting to, to share these, uh, these details. And now, as promised, we would like to, to go to the part two of this presentation, and we will go with uh, Mr. Peruchot um, to talk about uh, maybe your story as an entrepreneur, uh, and if I may say, for you to share a bit of the Saint Honoré recipe in Vietnam, Philippe Perrucho. Um, so, if you allow me, I would like I prepared a few questions, kind of uh, uh, wild questions to, to 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 help us understand better about your your journey and your success in Vietnam, and maybe to start with the. Uh, the business development in Vietnam. What's the what's the recipe? How did you uh, develop the, your business? When did you arrive? Uh, how uh, has the sector uh, changed and developed over the years? Philippe, the floor is yours. Can you hear me, Philippe? If you do not hear me, I will have to, to share about my experience as a Saint Honoré customer when I go there to have some French pastries. But okay. now I'm going to. Okay. Can you hear me? Ah, so, yeah. Very good. So, um, yeah, good, good morning or good afternoon, depends uh, where you are. So, um, uh, my name is Philippe Peruchot, and I've uh, been uh, in Vietnam for about 30 years, uh, developing different type of businesses. And um, uh, at the present time, um, uh, 12 years ago, uh, 2000, or oh, actually 14 years ago, uh, in 2010, um, I developed uh, production and distribution food for food products, uh, mainly on the bakery, pastry, and uh, other type of uh, food uh, distribution. Uh, so actually, uh, I, I started in Hanoi, which uh, most of the time people uh, start with Ho Chi Minh because economically that's where uh, you are and uh, that's uh, economic uh, uh, dynamic. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I was in Hanoi, so um, I thought uh, that uh, Hanoi would be a good idea to start. Uh, so after uh, 12, 14 years, we get 12 shops in Hanoi, uh, one in Ho Chi Minh. Uh, we have a factory of 2,600 square meters. Um, we have a certification also, uh, FSSA 22,000, uh, and the production, as I say, is uh, Bakery Pass 3, and we got Central Kitchen as well. We have one production center in Ho Chi Minh, uh, 300 staff, and uh, 
but to of course be um, among uh, the trend is we are uh, uh, being um, uh, committed for env environmental and responsibility fair. Thank you, uh, Philip. Maybe if I may ask a question, oh, yeah, actually that's about the distribution itself, because you, you have a factory in the north of Vietnam, uh, then how do you manage the distribution? If you can share maybe advice um, to, to the people listening to us today, listening to you, uh, from your experience, can you share? Yeah, um, I will come up uh, later with that. Uh, first, I want to the, 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 the read uh, the, the people understand exactly, uh, you know, some uh, what we're doing and uh, and part of the, the that it's also uh, uh, the distribution as well. So we have retail, of course, with different type of concept. Uh, we have the uh, wholesale where, of course, we need to have a specific distribution. So we have a internal distribution to our shop and we have also a B2B distribution uh, where a different uh, customer between uh, supermarket, uh, hotel, restaurant, cafe. Uh, we have the distribution for catering, which is specific also. And uh, we also have export. And also we use uh, the online service uh, for a, a, a trend uh, delivery and trend uh, uh, selling actually uh, at the present time uh, in, in Vietnam as um, uh, all the, the other country. Um, this is our type of product, so you can see, I'm not going to go too far about that, but, you know, all the bakery, you know, what, uh, what we have, uh, we cover a large, I mean, compared to even the bakery or in France, uh, we are a little bit uh, even uh, more uh, developed in, in this term. Uh, we also, you could see that we're also starting uh, the ready, uh, uh, ready to eat uh, product as well. Uh, which is, uh, we feel that is going to be uh, interesting in the future. Um, I, I just want to uh, push a little bit on the FSC 22,000 certification to make sure that uh, you understand that Vietnam is not uh, only, it's not the jungle or it's not, uh, it's an emerging country, but uh, we can still um, uh, reach a certification, which most of the uh, probably none of the, the bakery maybe in, uh, in France or, or, or other places uh, uh, don't have. Uh, maybe they don't want to, but uh, this is the certification above uh, ISO 22000. Uh, and uh, why did we go for that? For uh, several reasons, but the first reason is that it uh, was pretty good for us to have a framework um, in our factory uh, where we could uh, have a really clear uh, to the employee, uh, how what is the, the standard is and what we, they have to follow uh, with a backup on the, with the uh, certification. And actually, it works uh, because, as I as I will say later, uh, middle management is always a challenge here a little bit. So um, transferring the information and having a chain of command, it's it's kind of complicated. So uh, to have this framework, at least. Uh, uh, you know, we have the training and everybody understand uh, um, uh, what they have to do. Of course, the other benefit is uh, food safety uh, and risk management, uh, regulatory requirement as well, customer expectation, uh, improve our market access, competitiveness. Also, we found that to have that in, the, in Vietnam is also um, attract uh, all the big player uh, in Vietnam. Uh, because nobody else has this certification, so uh, they they feel confident to eventually uh, start to work with us in terms of um, uh, supply. Um, we also um, uh, it's another also uh, advantages for the export. So we already exported uh, um, uh, to Japan uh, and uh, in frozen containers. So uh, the advantage is you don't have to supply. Um, uh, many um, paperwork, you know, to, uh, to, to the customer abroad. Uh, so this is basically the saint distribution uh, channel. So we have 63% for now it's a retail. Um, uh, the B2B is about um, 32% and we have 5% on, uh, on catering. Um, so as you see, our channel is uh, retail, wholesale, digital. And the selling website as well. So selling website is uh, starting to 
I, I basically um, increased the marketing staff to be able to push more on the of course, digital and website and selling on, online. <clears throat> uh, since also we are going to even uh, multiply uh, the number of our products uh, to uh, with uh, our new uh, central kitchen. Uh, so navigating uh, in Vietnam distribution, it, it's kind of, uh, uh, you have to understand the, the local uh, market dynamics, of course, uh, customer preference. I mean, all the normal uh, standard uh, uh, issue that uh, you, you have probably everywhere. Uh, of course, patterning, and uh, that's what um, uh, previously uh, Remy uh, was talking about uh, with, of course, local distribution aid or agents. Uh, if you import um, and with um, uh, foreign experts, uh, that's um, uh, probably will beneficial, be beneficial for establishing a successful uh, distribution network in, in Vietnam. Uh, additionally, um, of course, you conduct market research. Uh, however, I could say on market research, uh, you don't necessarily have the market. So, so sometime uh, um, for 14 years, uh, we have been uh, uh, launch in some product, taste it, see if it works, see if taking or not, and then stop, and then you know get another product. So, so that's uh, also, and we are very happy when we have co some competition uh, because uh, basically uh, we can uh, uh, compare uh, our product with their product, and uh, of course uh, we are local market, so uh, sometimes we have uh, a little advantage on on the price which is not necessarily the case because we have to import the ingredients. And, uh, and, and uh, in, in Europe, uh, you have already a pretty good price on ingredients uh, based on volume. So, so it's balanced with uh, our local uh, costing. Um, also, uh, something yeah, can be, uh, the, the, the Vietnamese market also can be quite opaque uh, uh, and very specific uh, part particularity. So uh, sharing the same value uh, related to the foreign experts sometimes, it can bring you some uh, easy on the process. Um, Vietnam is basically two separate uh, country, I would say, the south and the north. So you have to, uh, as uh, Remy was saying, um, with two different mentality, um, uh, you have 1,600 kilometers between uh, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. So you can see uh, there is a challenge of uh, distribution from north to south. Uh, frozen distribution in general is, is a challenge as well. Uh, and, and more competition um, uh, in the south. Uh, but in the north, you have more barrier for the competition to come, uh, to come in. Yes? And there is a question actually from Serge, I see in the chat box, uh, actually yeah. about this topic. The, about the cold chain, Philippe, what is yeah. your uh, feeling about it? Is it well developed in Vietnam? Can you answer this question about Serge? And uh, I take the opportunity to, to, to ask everyone, do not hesitate if you have, have a technical question about the experience of Philippe for 30 years in, in Vietnam in the agri-food business. Uh, I think now is the right time to ask. So, uh, Philippe, the, 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 the cold chain in Vietnam, what do you think? Uh, the, yeah, the cold chain in Vietnam, uh, you have some uh, some uh, uh, option, uh, uh, it's uh, on, on the local basis, uh, Ho Chi Minh or eventually Hanoi. Uh, for us, we have all, we set up all our uh, 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 frozen uh, uh, container uh, in the factory. So we sort of like uh, cover most of the, our, our needs. Um, uh, the transportation would be a, a little bit of a challenge from, from the north to the south. Okay, so um, otherwise, I, I've seen in Ho Chi Minh a pretty well, pretty good uh, um, uh, warehouse, frozen warehouse with automatic uh, robots uh, taking, you know, like uh, everything on computer. So, so you get something very uh, uh, option uh, in the south. Uh, the problem is is really uh, between uh, between the two countries. and and other other places like uh, as we say. Uh, uh, iPhone or or Danang or you know all these uh, sub sub uh, city that uh, you still have a market uh, and it's going to grow anyway. So, uh, excuse me, Philippe. We have another question for you yeah. coming from the YouTube audience. 
so uh, if we if, if you have if you have a little time maybe you can uh, you can answer that but if it's a long answer we can uh, follow up later it's a question about the um, the 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 best uh, exhibitions in Vietnam where a European company could uh, participate to get a uh, a good visibility in Vietnam so what would be a good uh, FNB exhibition here in Vietnam yeah, you have one in uh, called FNB uh, trade or something like this. Um, I've been some uh, some time. Uh, it's still not very uh, exciting, but uh, I've seen this year uh, a, a number of uh, exhibitor in uh, when I was in Paris in January for the uh, CIRA. CIRA is a food uh, food exhibition uh, in uh, combined with uh, European, which is uh, more like a flower of. Uh, Bakery exhibition, and uh, they were uh, they were going to this exhibition in the south. So first of all, the best exhibition for now are uh, probably in the south yet, and then uh, the exhibition after you have the surrounding, you have Thailand, uh, you have Singapore, uh, where um, uh, the, the the market is bigger, the 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 the, the, expose, the, the, expo, uh, the exhibitor are, are bigger also, are more there. So they sometimes. Uh, uh, like Thailand, I uh, forgot the name of the exhibition, but uh, it's uh, so being in the regional also, you can consider that uh, so Thailand or Singapore. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I, I think regarding that, Philip, uh, from my humble experience, we uh, there is the so food and hotel in, uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. It was uh, yep. two weeks ago. And uh, we yeah. could see actually a lot of uh, European companies uh, exhibiting mm -hmm. and some uh, European visitors as well. On the yeah, French side, there's also a B2C, uh, B2C format uh, toward the, the Vietnamese audience in Hanoi, uh, Ballade en France, starting uh, this weekend. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the food and hotel. That's the one I was talking about. Uh, and then uh, in Ho Chi Minh. Um, I think it's growing. So um, I think uh, more the market will. Uh, will draw and uh, more uh, European uh, um, company will be interested to participate. Um, and, and I'm sure the Chamber of Commerce will uh, help a lot about that. Uh, and I encourage you to, to join, I've had to, uh, to reach us to, to, to get more information about that. Um, uh, just uh, continue on the skill, uh, labor skill, because uh, of course, uh, it, it, it's what, um, uh, so, as I say, is, uh, basically, there is a difference between North and South, uh, and especially on the, on the management position, uh, uh, the, the North are, are more, uh, can go down to the South, they can live there, there's no problem. There's a slightly different in terms of the language, of especially word. Uh, and then, um, uh, and, and most of the time, they, they, they would hold a management position. Uh, 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 the south going to the north, uh, they, it's more, more difficult. So try to avoid if you have a manager from the south to send him uh, to manage the north because it's, they don't feel comfortable. It's not their culture. It's, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, team, uh, the team is very important, of course, like everywhere, human resource. This is the key for success. Um, uh, it's... Um, uh, you can, you have to, it takes time to find a good team and you can trust. And also, um, they will, they will solve a lot of uh, internal Vietnamese problem that as a foreigner, you, you, you will understand 50% or even if you understand, but you don't want to get in, involved because they have a, a way to, to deal with that. Uh, and of course, um, our other value on, on the management uh, uh, as a foreigner is the um, is the vision and, and the anticipation. And uh, for the anticipation, uh, that's why you need experience and time uh, in Vietnam, and I think in Asia, probably in, in, in general. Uh, fourth is the, um, uh, the culture value. Uh, uh, Vietnamese culture value, the persuasion and uh, consensus building. So uh, even if the approach uh, probably may vary, uh, there is no, uh, uh, a guideline for for managing uh, or for uh, attitude, but uh, you have to take into consideration these two parts because they are very uh, part of the Vietnamese culture, which is persuasion. Um, uh, so often, uh, of course, in involve uh, building trust and uh, rapports with other people. So 
So Vietnamese are very, uh, they don't like a direct confrontation or aggressive persuasion technique. Uh, um, there are some, some company, they have a problem uh, uh, to deal with, uh, with that. Um, and, and, and also some, uh, some uh, management. Uh, so instead the subtle persuasion technique, uh, of course, they, they, they like to, to joke a lot, so anecdote, uh, funny, uh, uh, has to be building logical argument. Uh, if they understand the argument, they, they, will, uh, they will go for. Uh, emotion, it's, it's also uh, uh, important in the, your relation with, uh, with the Vietnamese um, uh, staff. Huh? Um, uh, of course, so respect of authority, seniority also play a significant role of, uh, in persuasion. So, uh, consensus, um, uh, strong uh, str uh, on the decision making, uh, the Vietnamese uh, like to get all together, uh, so they spread the responsibility on all each other, uh, so they don't have to take uh, one single personality. So they, you know, they, they try to communicate between each other. Maybe that's what we can call uh, democracy. I don't know. <laughs> Just uh, uh, the fact that it's uh, it's pretty interesting because uh, we have a uh, uh, when you participate to all these uh, these conversations, sometimes uh, you yell a little bit, sometimes. Uh, but it's very uh, very uh, enriching, uh, very rich for us also, and uh, and we go forward. Okay, so uh, uh, really, um, what is important in, in that is that. Uh, um the uh the, the the to maintain uh understanding and not necessary to to go in details uh just try to to make sure that uh whatever company you have it go forward uh so the strength is uh you know skill force i mean they are pretty good uh, ability work ethic also uh growing education system we still need uh a sort of like we call a BTS in France, which is senior technical certificate for middle management. There is a lack a little bit on the, on this on this part. Uh, language skill. Uh, I have uh, people at uh, now. I mean, what you consider in Europe, uh, maybe really really middle management level. They all speak uh, Vietnamese, of course, uh, English and French uh, often. So they got three language. Um, I don't think there's a lot of people doing that in uh, in Europe. Uh, speaking uh, for three languages and uh, of course the competitive labor cost uh whether it's starting to, to push a little bit because the level of unemployment as you see in about three percent so so it's still um uh, you still want to retain the good one okay so you still have to if you're a good company you still have to fight uh, uh for uh, for um for the salary as well um but uh, of course, the salary is important for the, the, the Vietnamese, but more important is that uh, they have to be in a good environment. They have to like you. They have to, you know, they feel comfortable with you. Uh, my way of management is to try to give them uh, some uh, some uh, responsibility or so as, as much as, as I can. And they, they, they take it and, and try to make sure telling them that, okay, if you do wrong, it's fine. Uh, you know, try to again. Uh, and then we have the China plus one that I'm not going to elaborate on that. Uh, so it's, of course, um, uh, take uh, um, uh, another, another advantage for that. I, I, I underline the skill mismatch uh, because that's what the, the point is. That's why I've seen so many people coming to Vietnam and, and, and get out after one year, two years, three years. Uh, with um, a nervous breakdown. So uh, you have the, um, uh, despite, as I say, improvement in education and training, uh, there's still a gap, okay, between the skill uh, uh, asked uh, by, uh, by the employer and, and the process uh, uh, for the workforce. Or, so there's a, a mismatch a little bit, uh, and, and you have to understand that, and you have to be patient. So patient is, Vietnam, Asia, but it's basically the region. It's uh, it's a uh, number one word. Uh, language barrier, of course. Uh, Vietnamese is quite a complicated language uh, because intonation, and uh, they don't really uh, push the effort to try to understand you. So when they see you as a foreign fest, they speak if they can in English. 
uh, even if you try to speak to them in uh, Vietnamese. Okay, so and a limited uh, specialization, or as I say, of course, they need some uh, some some training. Uh, the opportunity is investment. I'm going to pass that uh, uh, expansion on many on the education, of course, and emerging um, industry. Okay, so that's more like for the labor force uh, and the threat. Okay, threat is competition uh, with the uh, local uh, region, uh, of course, uh, uh, to attract some uh, some Vietnamese uh, there. Uh, the scale uh, scale uh, uh, staff and uh, also cheap labor, uh, automation technology. Of course, more and more I see um, by myself. I. I, I start to uh, step by step more, put a little bit more uh, technology <clears throat> in in the in the in the process and uh, and the brand right okay so um uh tip for success sorry i i miss your <laughs> can you ask the question yeah there are many questions so so maybe you can you can uh, wrap up here with the with the last slide maybe and then we can uh, ask uh, one or two questions to the panel because we have uh, just a few minutes left. But okay, I didn't so, say anything because it was it was great and very interesting. <laughs> oh, maybe maybe we can finish by the tips for success. Yes, which please. Is one of your very good. one of your question. All right, so I put the chamber of commerce. Okay, so um, uh, why is that? Because uh, you are. Um, uh, you, uh, when I started this company, I, I was already um, about 20 years, no, not maybe 15 years in Vietnam. So I could understand the, the culture, I can understand a number of things. Uh, as you, as a, as an exporter uh, from Europe, uh, maybe, of course, you're going to meet people who understand uh, the, the culture and whatever uh, I understand. So the best place for that, unless you know, uh, every, you know someone, but particularly, but it's good to go to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, whatever it are, are they, French, uh, German, or all, uh, Dutch, and so on, uh, for, for, the, for, for the reason is because uh, all these Chamber of Commerce have experienced uh, members uh, in, in various, uh, uh, and various uh, sectors. So uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce will help you to basically uh, uh, going through the uh, labyrinth uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, our member and try to find you the, the best. So uh, actually, uh, it will help you to to get in the right direction uh, or to tell you what to avoid. Uh, also, uh, identify potential companies. Maybe uh, we have uh, a network. Uh, we have data, so uh, we could uh, definitely either to promote your product or uh, to start the production. Uh, because uh, it's very important as well. Um, identify for you the proper staff uh, as well. Um, introduce uh, also trustee legal advisor, as you uh, have some member already uh, give you some lecture. Uh, then we have the, some uh, co-working co office and office. Sorry, uh, I don't. I'm working for you, but uh, and some advocacy <laughs> uh, also. But I believe that's for uh, the. People uh, in Europe, uh, if they start by this 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 gate, I think that it will it will help them uh, will they help them help them a lot. Okay, uh, so you understand that 100 million people, it's not a small market. Uh, even if uh, uh, our consumer is not necessary, all the 100 million, you still have need to have some urbanization to to be done, um, and and it's a huge potential and it's just started. Believe me, it just started. So uh, to uh, to be the first to to conquer the market and and uh, and, and especially uh, against the Asian surrounding country Japan Korean Malaysia Thailand Australia uh, we have to we have to be creative also um, uh, I don't see any problem uh, my competitor Korean competitor uh, they uh, call their um, their shop tous les jours or uh, Paris baguettes or uh, whatever and they they don't hesitate to try to do my product so so please uh if there is anyone who can do noodle <laughs> you know for example in europe try to do the best noodle you can have and uh and, and again uh the ef uh, fta uh it's close to zero uh i say 25 it's uh, uh for example for part of my product so basically um uh, it's a time to to do it and don't wait so long 
Thank you very much. It was very uh, exhaustive uh, presentation, very clear. Um, the, the, we have a few questions and I would like to mention them to every panelist. Um, so we had one actually regarding distribution, like how to find a distributor. Philippe, you've mentioned a lot already. So maybe we could uh, ask uh, Laurent, Rémi, Julien, uh, with your experience, with the, the clients, uh, the companies you support, uh, usually, it's a pretty broad question, huh? what kind of uh, distribution exactly, etc. but maybe you have uh, something to share? Um, yes, I don't. Um, uh, uh, for, for, for the question about uh, finding a, a distributor, um, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, including Vietnam, uh, it's uh, relevant and important uh, to participate to the FoodEx uh, in Singapore and to the Typhex in Thailand, as I mentioned by uh, Philippe. Why? Because uh, most of the distributors being established in uh, Southeast Asia uh, country are present uh, at these events. Uh, moreover, uh, I would like to uh, emphasize uh, that the CCI uh, France Vietnam also can support uh, the EEN uh, network uh, to find a suitable and workable uh, distributor in, uh, in Vietnam uh, regarding its uh, good uh, network and experience uh, in, in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. Thank you very much. Any uh, other comment? Uh, Julien, you would like to ask, uh, add something maybe? Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, Remy is right and uh, and uh, not only the CCIV, but there are also many service providers can, that can help to connect uh, co companies together doing some companies matching. So uh, we, we, we can support as well. And, uh, and yes, I, I, I follow Remy and his comments. Okay, there is also, I see another question um, regarding the, the software services companies. Uh, on that, maybe uh, like the development of the software services companies uh, in the region in Vietnam, would you would someone would like to add something to give advice? Uh, we cannot hear you well, uh, Laurent. Sorry. Can you now? Is it better? No, we cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Um, just the time to, to finish this question. Maybe I, I will switch to the other question, the second part, part, part B of the question to Philippe regarding the cold chain. And the question from Serge was, if I remember well, about the international cold, cha cold chain experience. Maybe when you export to Japan from Vietnam, I understand maybe it's from, from this aspect. Uh, Philippe, what, what, what could you share about the, your experience within the international cold, cold chain, maybe outbound of Vietnam? Outbound. But outbound is easy. Uh, you, uh, you, um, you do most of the time either by air freight or by sea freight. Uh, you have frozen containers, so you have to load your container and then ship it directly to Japan or whatever it is. So it's not too complicated in terms of transportation. <clears throat> uh, for that. So uh, more, more is like storage, you know, I would say uh, people who, uh, who need the distribution and they want to have a intern, internal storage. That's more important. Uh, outside, outbound is not a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe Laurent. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me right now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, better. I think it's better. Okay. All right. So I think for, for the uh, we're talking about the EU uh, software services companies, what well, one channel could be Eurocharm. I think Eurocharm would have uh, probably a list of identified uh, companies. Alternatively, uh, to have a, a more comprehensive uh, view, we there are access to databases. There are databases where you can actually uh, identify companies by sector, by region. So we, in Maza, we basically use some of these uh, worldwide databases and we can filter by sector, by country, and so on. So that's one, uh, another way. Uh, but for main players, I'm sure uh, they would be benefited by the workshop. And just to know that I think for the software, it's, it's another sector, right? But the software uh, development industry has favorable tax incentives in Vietnam for a while. 
and there's a very competent uh, workforce in Vietnam and a lot of uh, players. So this is a very attractive sector for programmers. Thank you, Laurent. I could decipher uh, part of what you've mentioned, but it was a bit hard to. If you have more questions, of course, to the panelists, uh, because we need to wrap up. We are already late, so sorry about that. Uh, if you have more questions to other panelists, please uh, contact them directly or just drop us a, a note at the EEN Vietnam. Of course, we are happy to support uh, anyone. Um, I would like to wrap up by thanking all the EEN team, of course, all the panelists of today, Julien Tran, Rémi Nguyen, Laurent, and Philippe Peruchot. I would like to thank you very much for taking the time to share uh, very relevant insights to the participants today. And I would like to thank a lot EEN Network. It's a very uh, nice, beautiful and strong, strong network. Uh, we are so happy to work together with the, our colleagues in, in Europe, especially, especially Thomas Steyert, that has been supporting us for a very long time. So a big thank you to all the team. And um, by, by, by that, I would like to, to give the floor to one of our EEN uh, agri-food sector uh, colleague, uh, Spiros, Spiros Kelidis. Uh, we would like you to give the, the closing remark uh, on this webinar uh, to, to share a bit of your understanding and, and your closing remarks. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we, re we, of course, we remain at your dispos disposal for any further information. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, really very nice presentation, some very interesting insights that we have had during this long lasting webinar on doing business in the Vietnam agri-food sector. My name is Piros Kalidis and I work for the organization development Anco SA in Greece and I am the chairman of the agri-food sector group in the Enterprise Europe Network. As we wrap up, let's take a moment to recap some of the key points that we have discussed and heard from the very nice colleagues and present presentations that we have had. Uh, I would like to point out that Vietnam is the highest growth center in the world with a growth rate of about 125%, that is really extremely high. Uh, first export market in the Asian and uh, the IPR help desk in South Southeast Asia is one of the key resources that somebody can use. Of course, the Vietnamese business environment and the macroeconomics and demographics were the key points that we have had today. Uh, the agri-food sector, the farm, the from home, home to pork, uh, the Vietnamese agri-food sector is an unparalleled uh, position in the economy, which is the most resilient sector. And it, there has been an evolution in, of the agri-food trade to Vietnam in 2018. Not to forget about the EU-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, which has been signed in 2019 and ratified in 2020, which provides a solid, solid regulatory framework and of course the market access database which has already been uh, described a little bit by the uh, by our speakers import duties with certain examples that we have heard and of course the trade turnover between vietnam and the eu has grown rapidly having as the main vietnamese export eu key markets the netherlands the germany and the uk of course, the difference between the north and south of Vietnam, which provided us with a cultural understanding, the awareness, the product features and the strategic approaches. In order to export to Vietnam, you have to find the right representative and of course the distributor. Last but not least, we have, or the companies in the food and beverage sector uh, have to be aware of the regulatory framework in Vietnam and of course the food safety system certification that has been described by our uh, colleague, by our uh, presenter. Moreover, I would also like to emphasize the support provided by the sector group AgriFood through the Enterprise Europe Network. For those of you interested in further exploring business opportunities in Vietnam, being the chair of the sector group AgriFood, I'm honored to lead one of the largest sector group with more than 100 members from 20 out, 28 countries worldwide. 
that is committed to facilitating international collaborations and promoting business growth in the agri-food sector. Moreover, on our ongoing efforts to support businesses in Vietnam, our sector group has already started implemented, implementing initiatives with third countries, such as our Meet the Buyer series. This is an online event serves, uh, which serves as a unique platform where international buyers present their companies and the specific products they are seeking to source. The agri-food sector group members representing various regions covered then collaborate to identify local producers within their regional respective uh, areas. These producers' profiles are then subsequently forwarded to the international buyer, facilitating vulnerable connections and potential business opportunities. Now I encourage you, each of you, to take advantage of all speakers and specialists in the network to explore potential partnerships with international businesses. Some of our, of our next steps that we can consider, reach out to our speakers and fellow participants, get connected with the sector group agri-food from the Enterprise Europe Network, take some time to conduct further research in due diligence, and of course, make sure of the EEN resources. Remember, success in the agri-food sector requires persistence, innovation, and a willingness to adapt to changing market conditions. But with the right knowledge and strategic approach, the opportunities in Vietnam are boundless, as we have heard. Before we close, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our speakers for sharing their expertise, to all of you for your active participation and engagement, and of course to all sector group agri-food members for their ongoing support and commitment to promoting international business collaboration. Together, we can unlock the full potential of Vietnam's agri-food sector and contribute to its sustainable growth and development. Thanks once again, and I look forward to seeing you at our future events. Best of luck on your journey of doing business in Vietnam. And having said that, the uh, word is back to Adam again. Thank you. Spiros, I really have nothing to add except uh, thank you very much for these uh, great closing remarks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining and for your precious time. Have a wonderful day. See you soon.